Hello, everybody. Uh, Redis Labs uh, is uh, starting to, to be uh, present in uh, India, but actually the Indian community is started with Redis. I mean, uh, uh, many of the most important use cases I saw in the American unicorns uh, at the start of Redis were often developed by Indian people. So basically, the, the open source started this adventure together with the Indian community, with the uh, Chinese community, with the American European community. So we are all a, <laughs> a big family. Uh, today, my presentation is uh, uh, very technical. Uh, we will show, uh, we, we will try to, to, to understand what's new in uh, Redis 6, but especially why these features are there and how they are implemented inside, the implementation details. And, and what are the advantages for developers? Because, you know, Redis is 10 years old at this point. It's very easy to get carried away and add features after feature. We, usually, I, I need a very strong motivation in order to add something. Otherwise, I would rather uh, have a slower path forward. So, uh, you see, uh, the big things are ACL, the, because uh, before that, Redis had just a flat uh, access condor, which was a single password. You can access all the system or nothing. Uh, instead, now we have a more fine-grained uh, ability to understand uh, uh, if a user can perform or not certain operations. Then there is the new protocol, REST3. We will see why we have it. And then the encryption in the connections, the client-side caching, uh, modus LPIs, uh, IO threads, and, and so forth. Uh, so let's start with the first features, the, the, the ACL, and understand the motivations and the implementation. Uh, to start, uh, the ACLs, are there in order to solve two different problems. One problem is security, and the other problem is uh, isolation. Security is obvious, in, especially in, lar in large uh, organizations. It is not nice that any client that can access a given instance can do everything. And since Redis uh, is not designed in, in order, you know, to babysit the user, it allows to do everything. Like, you can call very dangerous comments. Uh, so, with ACLs, you can, see, you can say, I have uh, five users, and each user is able to run a different set of commands. And you can even specify that uh, a given user can access a given subset of the key space, and another user, uh, another, another pattern of uh, keys, and so forth. Uh, However, while designing the ACL, uh, I had a very uh, main goal that was the ability to have ACLs without impacting the performance of Redis in any way. So if you use ACLs or not, Redis will be the same speed. The way this was accomplished uh, was with an implementation trick. Basically, when Redis starts, it uh, uh, sets a command ID in every command. Then uh, every user has a bitmap populated with zeros and ones, depending on the fact that a given command can be executed or not. So when uh, uh, a command is, is going to be executed, we have just to, to check a single bit. And in, in, the, in the big picture, testing for one bit in Redis is uh, zero. So it is impossible to, to have uh, any miserable slowdown uh, in the execution of the command. Uh, let's do just a quick live session. So we start Redis instance. Uh, oh, one, one important thing is that in Redis, we have a tradition of not breaking the compatibility with the past. So the default behavior of the server is that every connection can do anything that is it was like the Redis 5 default. So I am here, I can do set foo, bar, get foo, whatever I want. Uh, and by default, I am the default user. So 
how it was possible to have backward compatibility and the new system. Basically, every new connection is authenticated by default uh, with a user called default. If you change the permissions of this user, you can have different behaviors for the new connections. Then we can create an, a new user. Uh, now, the set user um, uh, ACL subcommand takes a free form uh, grammar in order to specify what the user can do and what cannot do. And you can find it in, uh, in the example redis.conv. Exactly. The ACL rules. So you can tell on and off to say if the user is enabled or it's disabled. You can add and remove commands, or you can add whole categories of commands in a single command, and so forth. So let's try. For example, we can say that the user under it is enabled. We specify a password for it, and we say that it can and access all keys and can execute the get and ACL command. Okay? There is also ACL list. And now I can see that there are two uh, users defined now on my system. One is uh, default, no password. It's active because it's on. And it can execute. Uh, this one means that it can execute every uh, commands against every key and so forth. Instead, in the, in the case of the user and reads, there are limitations. Because you can see that there is, uh, before there is minus all. So let's exclude all the commands. And then let's just add get and ACL. Let's test this new user. I can authenticate uh, with the new user. Now that I am uh, the user uh, anti-reds, I can get four, but I cannot set it because I have no permission to do that. So uh, I said security and uh, isolation. Security is quite obvious. Let's talk a bit about isolation. The point, the point is that sometimes you have, uh, uh, you are, uh, maybe you are a small startup and you don't really have concerns about uh, clients that can do something and clients cannot do something. However, you may be concerned about bugs that create a big problem in the Redis side. For example, uh, I have a library using Redis, and in the test of the library, I have a flush all command that will destroy my data set. If I define a user, even if for error the test is executed against the production instance, I will not cause any damage. So that's the point of isolation. REST 3. Why, after 10 years, we wanted to change protocol? The reason is that uh, the old protocol was good enough, but it created uh, a specific prob pro problem with client uh, uh, implementations, client libraries. So now I am with the old uh, protocol. Let's return back to the default user. If I create a set and I create a list, and I ask Redis for all the elements uh, of the, uh, my set and all the elements of the list. As you can see, the replies are exactly the same. However, it makes sense from the point of view of the client library to return the list as an array and the set as an hash, maybe populated with the first containing the elements and then the value set to true. Because if I have a set, it's very important to, to, to do certain operations in a very fast way. For example, testing for membership. And if I have a list, it's always an O1 operation to scan the list. So how it worked before, the client library needed to know each command, 
how is uh, uh, handled by Redis and the kind of reply it will return back, and then have a function in order to convert such Redis reply, which was always a fat reply, a fat uh, uh, plain array in the case of uh, aggregate uh, data types, and convert it to the right uh, data type. This means that, for example, a client library that was created one year ago will not work very well with uh, a command that was introduced in Redis one month ago. Uh, on, or even worse, initially it works because many use like bi late binding of commands, but it will return, uh, for example, an array. And then when it is fixed and implemented properly in the client library, it changes the reply because now there is the conversion function that returns uh, instead of an array, for example, an hash. So the application upgrades the client library and suddenly it, it no longer works as expected. So the new protocol is more semantics. It is able to, to represent uh, sets, uh, maps, all the data types that Redis normally returns. And uh, if now we switch to the new protocol using the hello command, so basically, Every new connection will start with the old protocol. So again, the ba backward compatibility story that we to already talked about. If you want, you can handshake with Redis the new, the new protocol. And also, this is useful because uh, if uh, hello returns uh, a no command error, you know that you are talking with an instance uh, which is not able to support the new protocol. But if you can, can perform the handshake, now the reply changes. So, L range will still return a list because it's a list, but as members, this time will return a set. You can see the difference here because instead of the uh, parent, you will see a tile. And uh, so forth, for example, HM set, my hash, this is an hash. And this returned as an hash. So this allows to create much simpler uh, client libraries without conversion functions. Uh, and sh I hope that this will be able to standardize a, a, a bit the client ecosystem. It's not just like that. Uh, also, it's able REST3 has more advanced features. For example, in a single connection, now you can have a pub sub and the normal commands. You can mix stuff. You can have basically uh, push information from the server because normally RESP2 was request reply. Now the, con the, the server can inform you with messages inside the connection. Like, uh, I don't know, for, for now it's just used for a few features, but later we can have uh, also Redis able to, to send uh, to the client information like uh, my CPU is uh, almost 100%. Uh, Maybe you can switch server or try to send read requests to the replicas and so forth. Next feature, the SSL. Okay, there is not much to, to say about it, just with the new regulations and stuff like that, it's very important that SSL is supported. And finally, we have uh, uh, support inside the core. Uh, thanks to the work of my colleague Yossi, this was implemented in a very clean, clean way, abstracting the connection object in order to support both plain text and uh, encrypted connection. Uh, Client-side caching. Uh, for many use cases, Redis is fast enough that it's not a problem to ask Redis for data. Uh, normally, you can uh, obtain uh, the information you're looking for in a matter of milliseconds, and often in less than one millisecond. However, there are certain use cases where there is the desire to be able to cache information in the client side. For example, imagine an IoT application that talks with the cloud, and there is quite some late latency, because there is internet in the, in the middle. And, uh, uh, if we can uh, take the information that usually this IoT device 
asked to, asked to the cloud directly inside the memory of the IoT device, this is a, a big advantage. However, there is the invalidation problem. So the new feature called the client-side connection allows to put the connection in a new mode. We say, please, Redis, track every key I'm asking to you. And when you execute the command and give me the reply, also remember that I may have a copy of this key. And when the key changes, send me an invalidation message so that I can evict this data. Otherwise, I will assume that it's still valid, and I will avoid to ask again the server. So basically, in this way, every client can have a subset of the keys that are in the, in the server. They're directly in the application level, in the application side memory. Uh, uh, sometimes this can create a speed, speed up of uh, 100 times which is uh, a lot, especially can change the interaction with the user. For example, my IoT device could be a thermostat, and uh, instead of experimenting any delay, I can have uh, an immediate response of the device. Uh, so it's, uh, it's going to be client-side caching. Ready6 is now in the first release candidate. Client-side caching is the feature that is going to have the maximum amount of change before we go to JGA, because it works already quite well, but we want to add new features to, to it. Uh, IO threads. So Redis is single threaded, and uh, uh, I uh, and my colleagues in Redis Labs believe that uh, it's, it's a good idea in general uh, to try to scale Redis uh, having more instances instead of a single instance using threads. There are a few reasons for that. The first reason is that in a shared nothing model, you're able to maximize what you can get from the hardware. Because anyway, threading will require uh, uh, some kind of locking, and it will slow down in general the, 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 the total amount of operations you can run compared to have different, serv different processes, uh, each handling a subset of keys. Another important reason is that this, this maximizes the amount of uh, operations you can run per watt of energy. And, now, energy is a very important resource, both because for environmental issues and also because it means also to save money. Uh, and also there is another aspect, which is the complexity. A completely threaded Redis is a more complex object, which is more likely to break. Now, in, the, in, in these 10 years of history of Redis, the stability of Redis was a main asset of the system. Because people know that Redis uh, is uh, reliable, and they, can, they are sure that most users will never see Redis crashing a single time uh, in the entire uh, uh, li life of the application. So this is an important asset. Threads increase the complexity of the system of an order of magnitude. So if we can get more with less, uh, it's better that we remain like that. However, there was a possibility to introduce red threads in Redis, uh, not increasing the complexity of the system. While, uh, while profiling Redis, uh, we saw that most of the CPU time of the single instance is spent in the red and write system calls, especially in the write system call. So we, we thought, what about just making the right part threaded. When we basically are going to enter the event loop and write to all the clients, in this moment we just create threads, write to the client sockets, and then we ret return back single threaded. So all the access to the shared, uh, the, to, the, to the key space re remains single threaded. Just this uh, detail is uh, multi-threaded. And with, with, this, with this trick, it is possible to get uh, uh, to double the performance of Redis 
in the case uh, of pipelining is not used. If you use my, uh, pipelining, uh, there is no need to resort to this trick uh, because you are uh, amortizing uh, the I.O. cost a lot. But in case uh, pipelining is not always possible, this trick will, uh, will save a lot of CPU time and will speed up Redis significantly. Uh, another thing which is uh, not inside the Redis 6 core, but is conceptually part of the release, is the DSQ module. Uh, DSQ is a message broker that I created four years ago as a fork of Redis. You know that Redis is very often used for messaging. Uh, however, I wanted to create a system, and, and Redis is very good for messaging for a number of use cases. However, there are a few use cases where Redis is not good enough uh, for messaging, which is when you absolutely need your messages to survive failures. Uh, in this case, an AP system is better, a system that is synchronously replicated, maintains many copies of the messages, and uh, basically is able to guarantee that uh, a given message can survive up to a given number of nodes that fail. So I created this new system, and uh, it was quite good, but then I realized that to keep the common parts between Redis and DSQ synchronized was a nightmare, because every pull request I received in, in one side, I had to apply in the other side, but then uh, the other side was modified, so the, there was to do a merge too complex. So I gave up for some time. Uh, at the same time, we implemented the new si module system in Redis. And modules were capable of, of doing more and more. And uh, finally, recently, it was possible to implement DSQ as a Redis module. So I did this uh, a few months ago, and it works quite well. I can show you how it works. Uh, okay, so. Uh, here I created a, a small Redis cluster loading the disk module. So now this cluster is able to reply to new commands that are normally not available. Uh, I connect to one of these uh, disk instances, which is just Redis with the disk module loaded. And then I can create a new job in a given queue. And I can give it parameters, like, uh, okay, this is the timeout, replicate to three nodes, and retry the message every five seconds. Now that I have this message created, uh, I can connect uh, to a different node, because uh, this queue is multi-master, so you can pick a random node and talk with it. And I can ask uh, uh, for jobs. No, I, d I did some error. Uh, let me grab a bit in the history. Oh, get job. And you can see that uh, I have this job returned in the other node. I can ask again and again for the same job because uh, I use the retry parameter of five seconds. What is this retry parameter? Basically, uh, this queue is a system where when you process a message, you have to acknowledge to the system that the message is processed. Otherwise, this queue will assume that the message was lost. So when I want to finally uh, mark the message as processed, I will use the act job message. But before that, I want to show you something. If I get the message ID and I use the show command, I will see a few informations about the, the message. So this is the ID, the queue, the state, and so forth. Uh, I can see that it was delivered to three different nodes. 
This means that I have three different copies. When I used the, the add job command, what happened was that the message was synchronously replicated. So the message was uh, copied to other two instances. And only when those two instances replied, OK, I have a copy, the client for, was finally unblocked and the idea of the message was redundant. Now, if I, I use act job here and the message is evicted, now this message doesn't exist here, but also I can connect to the other, uh, to the other instances and I no longer have a copy. This queue uses a system that's called uh, federation, which is quite used in messaging systems. Uh, however, here it is uh, a bit extreme as a concept because uh, nodes can federate to do quite interesting things. For example, imagine that you create all your messages in a given mo node and then your workers are asking for messages in other nodes. Immediately, the nodes will form a, a pipe in order to move the new messages from one node to the other. Uh, otherwise, when a given uh, node is uh, low on memory, the messages created in this node will automatically be moved in new nodes and so forth. And this happens all uh, automatically without you to notice. So this is the demonstration that uh, the module system of Redis uh, at this point is, is capable of being a, a platform to create complex distributed systems. And this is a great advantage, because if you want to create a new system, because you want to specialize something for your use case, there is no need to, to start from scratch. You can use already a system that has a protocol, client implementations, and there's a lot of uh, APIs too you can already use uh, pre-cooked for you. And uh, then another part of, uh, of this release is, is the Redis cluster proxy. One of the problems that we have with Redis cluster is that uh, client libraries are very slow to adopt Redis cluster. Uh, and you know, even if certain clients adopted Redis cluster, there is a big turnover in the client ecosystem. Then one client becomes old and a new one emerge and we start from scratch again with the new client maybe not having already the cluster support. So we, we, we thought maybe we can solve that with a cluster that has abstracts the cluster protocol and you see a normal Redis instance, but instead the, the, the proxy is able to talk with the cluster and mediate for us the cluster protocol. And uh, this is what we did and I have a, a demonstration. Okay, so this is the, the cluster proxy help. So to execute it in a very simple form, we just tell it one of the nodes of, the, of our cluster. So the proxy starts. It starts. It's completely threaded since the start. So it uses, uh, in this case, in this case, uh, eight threads. It means eight event loops separated at set of connections. So it's completely threaded with a shared nothing setup. And now I can, it's listening in this port, 77777. And uh, if I connect uh, to the proxy, I can use uh, it like if, if it was uh, a single instance. But instead, the proxy is distributing the uh, the data to the different nodes in my cluster. Now this, this uh, uh, proxy project has a, a number of uh, interesting features. Uh, for example, it is able to uh, perform multiplexing of different clients in a single connection as long as the clients are sending very simple com commands. When uh, the clients want to do more complex operations, for example, blocking commands, then the client creates a private set of connections. The proxy creates a private set of connections for this client. It is po possible to perform aggregations. For example, if you use the mget command, the proxy will send the gets to the different nodes and will report you the aggregated result and stuff like that. The internal design is very simple, so we try to, 
to make a, a proxy which is very hackable and then you can modify for your use case. Okay, the final command uh, we have in, uh, in this new Redis version is uh, the lolvoot command. This is a, a, a command that we change at every new implementation of Redis. And the idea is to, sh is to put some bit of uh, art from uh, uh, inside Redis. Uh, and uh, new, new versions will, uh, will create a dif different dynamic uh, uh, art piece. This is a uh, uh, one um, eight bit uh, 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 design of an Italian uh, developer that uh, writes software for 8-bit computers, but it was a fixed image. Instead, this is uh, uh, at every run you will see a different landscape. Uh, the old version was uh, a very important uh, piece of art in the in the story of computing. It's quite uh, old and is. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, art piece from NES. Uh, in, it used to be plotted because there were no screens back then when, uh, when uh, this artist operated. And I hope that this tradition will, uh, will continue in the new versions of Redis. So thanks for listening to me for so, so much time.